The married couple sat on my therapy couch. He was crying, uncontrollably sobbing. She sat on the edge of the couch, confused. She couldn't understand his level of distress. A few days earlier, she had discovered that he had discovered her text messages. They were explicit. They even contained explicit photographs. They were to a man that he didn't know. She said she'd met him whilst she was touring. This man meant nothing to her. She never intended to see him again. She said, it's not that I'm having sex or anything. He said to her, it's infidelity. I've been working as a couple and sex therapist and a clinical sexologist for the last 30 years. I understand and am very over-familiar with the script of traditional in real life infidelity. The man feels entitled, he's horny, he wants a sexual adventure, he maybe wants a divorce from his wife. He bends the secretary over the desk, the wife receives an anonymous phone call, she confronts him, he denies, he's defensive, he tells her she's suspicious, she should get over it. She tries to get over it. A few months later, she finds a credit card slip, which clearly shows that he's been in a hotel room with somebody else. She confronts him again. This time, he can't deny it. They come into therapy. She's betrayed, humiliated, feeling very shameful. He's contrite, remorseful, and filled with guilt. This infidelity conversation on my therapy couch was different. I didn't understand it. It felt like I required different intervention techniques for it, which I didn't have. I know the process of managing infidelity as a therapist. The couple come in, he is very apologetic, he acknowledges, he becomes very accountable for his actions for a long period of time. Both of them individually have to take responsibility for what has caused the affair. They crack open the marriage due to the raw honesty of what infidelity brings, and they examine the relationship that was before, trying to find some kind of enrichment, which is very possible after the affair. He kicks out the secretary, they have honeymoon sex for a number of weeks, they try and rebuild some trust, at the same time, they endure the great discomfort of trying to have either a divorce or an enriched relationship. This infidelity was curious for me, and I felt as frozen as the couples who sat on my couch. In fact, there was the traditional part of me that believed that actually, why is she fussing so much? Why is he so upset? After all, there hadn't been any physical exchanges of bodily fluids, which is what we associate with traditional sex. I became curious. Ashley Madison is a dating site that was started by Noel Biederman in 2002 in Canada, the world's largest dating site for married people, 39 million subscribers in 46 different countries, with a tagline that says, life is short, have an affair. They arrived in South Africa in 2012, and I was very publicly vocal and spoke out and said that I did not think this was a good idea to be bringing such a dating site to South Africa, which has such a high incidence of HIV, multiple partners being one of the drivers towards HIV. Until a few weeks later, women started trickling into my therapy room. These women told me that they were happily married, and with great curiosity, they had gone to the Ashley Madison site and found that they were cyber-texting, cyber-chatting, cyber-flirting, and even going offline to have sex with these men. They were feeling happy. They were feeling more satisfied in their online lives than in their real-life relationships, and they weren't feeling guilty. I realized that there was a new phenomenon that was emerging, and I called it cyber infidelity. I accepted Noel Biederman's offer to utilize his database, and I went to work. I created a site called mycybersecret.com, and I invited people to place their narratives, 
their cyber secrets, their cyber concerns, and their conundrums. I then went online. I created two different profiles, one as a married man and one as a single woman. I went live online for two years. I administered five different surveys into the database of Ashley Madison. I had 62,600 respondents, 21,939 of them were women, all between the ages of 18 and 55 plus, mostly married, mostly heterosexual, from five different countries, namely South Africa, the UK, the USA, Canada, and Australia. I had five questions that I wanted answered. What is cyber infidelity? Is it merely recreational fun and not really infidelity? Does it break our traditional vows of marriage? Is it something that we should be flexible about and just integrate into our real life lives? And what is it that we are expecting from our relationships today? The definition of cyber infidelity is that it is a process which is engaged in by two or maybe more people who are in a committed relationship. They use synchronous and asynchronous computer-mediated materials, such as emails, texts, even Skype, to be able to communicate with each other. It's always done in a secretive manner, and it's always done by people who are in a committed relationship and are violating the very principles upon which we know to be traditional relationships, namely monogamy, fidelity, and commitment. I became seduced online. The first thing that I realized in my seduction was that the term relationship is redundant. There are so many other different forms of relationship, encounters, exchanges, attachments, connections that we are using to describe what goes on between us, both online and offline. I became very absorbed in this world. And to this list, I added cyber infidelity. Considering the fact that we spend 22% of our time on social media, I realized that cyber infidelity is going to become a new form for us to become relating to other people. So very shortly, I began exchanging text messages with people using emoticons and very rich descriptive terms. I learned that my popularity depended on my wit, my humor, and my dexterity. I was breaking my own ethical beliefs by engaging with people that I knew were married, yet I felt guiltless. I felt happy. My self-esteem became enhanced, and it never interfered with my daily life. The reason for this is because we hold this device in our hands 24-7, and the driver of it is something called the AAA engine. It's affordable, it's accessible, it's anonymous. There were a variety of platforms from which I could choose at any one moment to access, whether I was lying in bed with a partner, working from my office, standing in line in a queue, I was able to access a cyber lover or a cyber chat wherever and whenever I wanted. It was affordable in that I did not have to spend money on clothes or restaurants. I didn't have to get dressed up. I could stay at home and I could be having fun. I enjoyed the anonymity of it not only because I was doing research, but because it gave me a freedom of expression that I'd never had before. It enabled me to learn a new form of communication which is endemic to online behavior. It's called hyper-personal intimacy, and it looks something like this. It begins with a very innocuous chat in a newsroom, on a Twitter feed, on your Facebook page, and in no time at all, I began, as you begin, to share very deep intimacies through this interactive, imaginary, fantasy world with a stranger who suddenly begins to feel more intimate to you than the very person that you are lying next to. This became a fascinating way of communication for me. This form of cyber infidelity 
this form of hyper-personal chatting with somebody who was unknown to me. If you consider what your real-life relationships are like, they're pedestrian, they're predictable, they're domestic pits of slog. You become over-familiar with the person who you're living with, and you feel domesticated, whereas in cyber world, we're conflict avoidant, we're sexy, we're having a playful, fun time. I wondered what it was that drove people onto this online space and what it is that they were expecting from their partners in their real lives. They told me that they expected from their partners, first and foremost, to be best friends. I was amazed. I thought they would say, my lover, my, my partner in bed, my erotic partner. But best friends was first on the list of expectations. Second of all was emotional attachments, emotional support, and economic support from a partner. And then, in the paradox of what the online universe is, they expected honesty and trust. Coming from a group of people who are sitting on an online dating site for married people, they also required privacy. I asked the married men what made them sign up on a dating site. They told me they were really happy in their relationships. They had emotional and romantic attachments to their primary partners, and also they had sexual and emotional contact with these partners. However, they were there for no-strings-attached sex, for adventure, for something a little more variety, and also they really weren't looking for an emotional connection with somebody else. The women told me they were sexually bored. I celebrated that women could say they were sexually bored in their primary relationships, and they were online because they were seeking no-strings-attached sex. They were not seeking emotional attachments, which broke all the stereotypes of what we expect from women today. They were seeking sexual encounters in addition to the encounters that they did have. In fact, it was the women that surprised me the most in my research. These women who are now in an unregulated, ungated environment of the online space are seducing and being seduced. They are provoking and being provoked. They are having fun. I'm going to tell you a story about a woman who touched me. A 65-year-old woman came to see my therapy practice around her sexual health. Her husband had recently died, and her children had encouraged her to get onto online dating. She entered this very new world where she started cyber flirting, cyber chatting, cyber sexting with one man in particular who she fell in fascination with. They met offline, and the physicality was concretized for them. They had their first sexual experience. He told her he was married. In a traditional form, she fell apart, she became angry, she said, I'll never see you again, and she went home and went back online, and she thought about it. And she contacted him, and she said, despite all of my ethics, my beliefs, I want to continue this relationship with you. We know that ethics are challenged online because of the liberalism of the space. 76% of South African women go offline between one and five days after their first online chat. Their encounters last for three months, and they go back online again. They do not believe that there are any consequences to them, such as divorce or STIs. The only consequence is that they may fall in love with a cyber lover. Their partners, their men, 58% of those men, go online. One to five days later, they're meeting for a real-life relationship or encounter or swinging or hookup or friends with benefits. These encounters last for about three months, and they tell me that the consequences to them is they might become attached to a cyber lover. But interestingly, these men found that online they were less inhibited, more emotionally sharing than with their own real-life partners. I asked the women what they were looking for. They told me satisfactory sex. I asked them, what is satisfactory sex? They told me, kissing and cuddling. <laughs> At the beginning, of my research, I had a hypothesis. I believe that technology is here to stay, 
And cyber infidelity is going to be something we have to live with. Suck it up. But it was the pain. It was the pain that changed my hypothesis. It was the pain of working with couples with cyber infidelity for the last two and a half years. Usually at the end of my therapy sessions, I end the evening feeling exhilarated and emotional from working with the pain of other people. This is the first time in nearly 35 years that I would come home heaving, sobbing, with the grief, the pain, and the compassion that I was feeling for the couples who were going through cyber infidelity. There are different levels of pain to cyber infidelity. Not only is it the usual infidelity pain of betrayal and shame and humiliation and a feeling of being excluded, but there is the pain of visualization, of having visual evidence of text messages that your partner has exchanged with somebody else who's not you, of images of themselves that they've sent that you thought were exclusively just for you. There is the pain of sexuality, the woman who lies next to you in bed and tells you every night that she's too tired to be sexual, you find her online with a whip in her hand and with lots of sexual desire. There is a pain of knowing that you are not the one and only and the most special. There is a pain of knowing that the vows of fidelity and commitment and monogamy are forever gone and that you're going to have to establish new rules of relationship. There is a pain of knowing that trust may be very difficult to ever regain because we walk around with a device in our hands 24-7. Now, my therapy room is filled up with lots of different kinds of interventions. We have different conversations now. The things that we talk about now are privacy, sex tech. We create netiquette guidelines, enabling each other to be able to know what is their definition of cyber infidelity and what would mean crossing over the boundary for you and for you? And how do we integrate our lives between technology and our real lives? We know that we want monogamy while loving more than one person at the same time. We know that we want sexual fidelity while being sexual online with other people. We know that we want commitment that's lifelong whilst having transitory experiences with other people online. I wish for you all playful, hyper-personal, intimacy, sexy, in-real-life relationships. Thank you so much. <laughs>